Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. The bridge wasn't long or wide. It was a simple wooden bridge over a narrow but deep gap between past disappointments and future uncertainty. My name is Lyle Jetterman. I'm 38 years old. I'm not much different from other men, except that I'm married to Gloria, who is 36, and I have two kids, Robert, who is 12, and Anna, who is 8. We're a nice family, but we have some money problems. To take care of my family, I worked at Countryman Realtor for five years until Gabriel Zillow bought the company from Bernie Schleifer. Real estate wasn't what I planned to do originally. I started my career after finishing law school. By that time, I had been married to Gloria for three years. She was pregnant when I graduated from law school. It wasn't a very promising job market for young lawyers, but Gloria's pregnancy gave me a strong incentive to find a job that could support my family. The first job I was offered was working for a law firm that specializes in representing banks and closing home loans. It wasn't the job I dreamed of, but it was a job. While I was in law school, Gloria worked as a bank teller to support both of us. She earned enough to pay the rent and feed us. I worked a few part-time hours, doing whatever I could to supplement her income. Loans and scholarships paid for my education, but I connected my future with the Department of Education. Since Gloria apparently became pregnant during my law school graduation, I accepted the job offer. This was only the first of many concessions to the strict demands of married life. Back in those ancient times, banks lent money to individual home buyers to purchase houses. In retrospect, it was the profession of a gentleman lawyer. I sat at the house flipping desks to represent the lending bank at the mortgage closing. The buyer paid the bank a commission of about $1.500 for my services. The law firm received this amount plus another $1.500 from the insurance company. Everything was talking about a solid $1,000 earned every time we shook hands at the end of the house. The company, of course, received money, and I received a tiny part of it as a salary. I think all good things must come to an end, and honest stinginess must be replaced by bad and pure greed. Right after my wife Gloria had our second child, small banks were taken over by big ones, and those big ones were taken over by even bigger ones. Ordinary people getting loans from banks became rare. Banking changed into a big business. Every day when I got to work, there was a big pile of paperwork for mortgages that needed to be finished that day. I think the banks were making a lot of money, but I felt uneasy rushing between rooms where houses were being bought and sold all at once. I didn't think this could keep going like this forever. In my seven years working as a lawyer, I didn't become a partner. Instead, I became a private contractor, which was still a good position. I earned money for each job I did. I made $1.75 for every house deal I closed, and I closed seven or eight deals every day, five or six days a week. But I wondered if this could last. I felt worried about something bad happening soon. Bernard Schliefer came up to me. He liked being called Bernie. He was searching for someone smart with a law degree to work for his company. His main worker was going to retire to a warmer place just when Bernie wanted to grow the business. Bernie's company, Countryman Real Estate, owned part of the Scarlet Woods development. This place had 100 approved areas for building, and they planned to have 400 more. It was two miles away from a technology park with an international company. Schliefer was someone who built things. He wasn't a salesperson or someone who lent money to small businesses. If you needed to convince a bank to give you a couple of million for your big plans, Bernie was the person to talk to. But he couldn't sell anything to a housewife with the addition of a real stone countertop or to her husband with a variable rate mortgage. Oddly enough, when Bernie and I met, everything was perfect. I enjoyed selling houses and was a detail person. It was all about these rustling paper documents of delivery. I also learned the value of profit centers from my former employers. I increased Bernie's sales by the amount sold by his own company, home insurance agents, movers, gardeners, and so on. We quickly became a full service agency with a single purpose. Our function was to sell more houses and get everything we could from everything that came Bernie started building, and he did it very quickly. I ran to the office and everything. Bernie did the big deals and I did the little ones. He earned a lot of money, and I worked for him and got paid well. He saw trouble coming. Bear Stearns was just the start of it. Lehman Brothers was the big problem. When everything fell apart, Bernie seemed happy. Things that go up must come down, but real estate always bounces back. If we can manage this situation without going too far, we'll be set for big growth later on. Bernie believed the market would recover. I worked hard and saved every penny, which Bernie used to buy larger and nicer country properties. 
Bernie only had one issue with it. He was a big fish in a small pond, and he wanted to go for a swim in the ocean. One evening over drinks after work, he broke the news. I sold everything, he said. What? Calm down. The new owner won't change anything, at least not right away. Bernie was right again. When I met Gabe Zillow, my first impression was of his youth. He was not yet 30, and he managed to buy Bernie out. He was taller and younger than me. And he was a handsome, blonde Adness, the very image of a business prodigy superstar. I probably should have been jealous of the young man, but he was too charming and affable to be indignant. It was great working for him, too. Bernie was approaching 50. He was ambitious, but essentially cautious. In contrast, Gabe loved to put everything out there for everyone to see. Everything is on the line. All the time. It was obvious from the beginning that his deal to buy a country property had drained Gabe's resources. Gabe was better at handling money than building things, and he was better at managing than selling. He liked making money quickly, and when the real estate market got better, his investment in Countryman was paying off well. Bernie was going to Florida to a big real estate event. The night before he left, I wished him good luck. Come along with me, he said. No, I can't. I'm not a kid anymore. I have a wife and two teenagers to take care of, I said. All right, but you might regret it someday, he replied. I hope not. But I started looking for other job options. There wasn't much left of my old company. Stephen Pender, one of the younger partners, managed to survive when everything went bad. He was happy to have me around, but he paid me only a third of what I was making before. So I worked really hard to keep our business going. But, in general, I was happy working for Gabe, as we called him. He treated me well and let me run the office most days. Did I have any doubts about him? Yes, but my only complaint was small. Bernie never organized a proper Christmas party. Gabe did the opposite. He rented one of the best places in Saratoga for a big party, even though it cost a lot of money. The next party, on the first Saturday in December, was for our staff, contractors, bankers, and real estate agents. It was a big, fancy party with lots of guests, and Gabe was like a king. Well, it was his money, and maybe there was a good reason for it all. But my problem started around midnight and got worse as the night went on. You see, I came to the party with the most attractive woman here. I married Gloria right after college. We were both only 22. She worked a dead-end job to support us all while I was in law school. I will be forever grateful to her for this, but she brought on her own pregnancy by going off the pill while I studied for the bar exam. Pregnancy may have been for the better in the long run. We were good parents and still are. While I was struggling with renting houses, Gloria was raising our kids and working at night to get her doctorate in child psychology. When our youngest child returned to school, Gloria returned to work. She found a job at the State Department. She also started what I now call her running career. Gloria could be called chubby. She was fat compared to some starved models. But at age 30, she went from swimming at the Uica pool for two days and running just after our kids to running solo long distances. Every morning, my wife got up early to walk five miles cross country. Every evening, she did half an hour of sprinting. She had the fastest time of any local female runner. Only national competitors have beaten her once in local 5K and 10K races. She competed in the New York City Marathon three times finishing in the top 100 women. I'm not a homebody. I go to the gym at least three times a week and bike 20 miles on summer weekends. But I have over 5% body fat, and I don't have a body that looks like it was sculpted by Michelangelo. I supported Gloria in her efforts. I watch my wife wake up before sunrise and return all sweaty after her morning exercise while I woke up the children. I felt proud of her. So, when I walked into the Christmas party with this tall, black-haired woman by my side, Everyone stopped talking and turned to look at the stunning Gloria. She was just a bit taller than six feet, even taller with her three-inch heels on, which made her the same height as me. Her dark hair flowed down her shoulders. When she runs, she ties it up in a ponytail, which always gets applause. That night, her hair sparkled in the light of the ballroom. Gloria did her best to dress up for the party. She wore a new tight black dress. The dress had a scallop trim that showed a bit of her chest and was short enough to show off her long, athletic legs. This dress made everyone notice her flat stomach and her well-shaped behind. She was the subject of passionate art. My wife was no longer a chubby girl. She was a wonderful woman in my arms. Gabe wasted no time in greeting us and leading Gloria off to dance. Although I admit that they were a lovely couple, he is taller and stronger than me. His attention seemed to cross the line of foul. 
Just before midnight, he approached her and kissed her passionately under the mistletoe. I'm not jealous. Yes, my wife is hot, but I trust her. We went through many difficult times together, years of law school, raising children, paying off school. We survived illness, including miscarriage. I feel sorry for the couples who never fought together. I believe it's the tough times that bring you together and make your marriage strong. Gloria and I experienced everything together and loved each other. Gloria was drinking and clearly enjoying everyone's attention. I chalked it all up to this. I picked up my wife and took her home. Nothing more was said, and she acted as if nothing had happened. I just drank too much. I told myself. Six months later, Memorial Day weekend arrived. The first part of the year went well for real estate. We had a lot more clients than before. The last week of May was really hot, the hottest in 10 years. Our company had a lot of money from selling houses, which was going to be put into our account on the first business day of June. We planned to check the checks and pay the banks online when the office opened after the long weekend. Are you coming camping for the weekend? Gabe asked me. Gabe had rented a cabin in the mountains for Memorial Day weekend. He had been talking about it for weeks. He invited both Gloria and me, but I wanted to avoid it. I don't know what Gloria's plans are, I said, trying to refuse him. Oh, she's with us, looking forward to it. I looked at him questioningly. We spoke on the phone, he said hastily. Why didn't I believe him? But when he left, I called Gloria, and yes, she was delighted. I believe this was the last moment to stop the train wreck, but I just didn't see it. I both loved Gloria and trusted her. MapQuest told me that the ride to Gabe's house would not be easy. I drove my Honda Accord to the rental place and picked up a four-wheel drive SUV. According to the map, the last 20 miles were on mountain roads and the last three on dirt roads. I've been to the Adirondack Mountains before. They can be very brutal mountains. Gabe's home was southwest of Saranac Lake. The journey took almost four hours. The GPS only showed the last five miles. We turned off the beltway onto the last two miles of semi-paved road that ended at a wooden bridge. The bridge was narrow but looked strong. Recently renovated, it crossed a ravine. The gap was not very wide but deep. This type of terrain is common in the Adirondack Mountains. Difficult terrain is the reason they remain wild. I slowly crossed the bridge, wondering if there was another exit. Although the GPS map didn't show one, I had the feeling of a mouse caught in a mouse trap. I wonder if there is a cat here. Three miles down a rutted dirt road, we came to a two-story house. It was built on a clearing on the side of a mountain about a thousand feet below the summit. A dozen Adirondack peaks were visibly to the north. We arrived at a distant place where there was a cabin that seemed rustic. I parked the SUV in a nice parking lot next to three similar, but much fancier, cars. Everything looked new and well taken care of. The cabin itself was a modern style log building that was made to look old fashioned. It was decorated with traditional panels, but had modern furniture inside. It looked like a big, comfortable modern building pretending to be an old mountain lodge from the 1800s. Gabe went all out to make it look like that. I was sure he wanted to impress someone, and it wasn't me. They welcomed us on the big porch with its wooden chairs and decorations. There were six of them, three young men, Gabe, and two of his college friends. Ken Lewis was the shortest and about fifth tenon, but built like a weightlifter. He was approaching 30, like Gabe. Ken was starting to go bald, and his face wasn't as handsome as Gabe's, but he was physically covered in muscles that showed through his tight t-shirt and shorts. Glenn Sachs was the second college buddy. About six feet tall, thin, with curly blonde hair. He looked better than Ken. He stood holding the blonde woman tightly in his arms. She was introduced as Sharon. She was a beautiful woman with curvaceous figures and a full bust. She must have been at least 30, maybe older, a good eight to ten years older than Glenn. A slightly younger woman named Robin stood next to Ken and was clearly with him. She was a short, bubbly brunette in her early thirties and very well built with breasts that seemed too large for her small body. The last of the group was a tall woman with long brown hair. It was Paula Henry, one of those women who, for lack of a better word, are called beautiful. Definitely a woman with attractive, but sharp, not entirely feminine features. Her appearance showed that she was smart. She knew it, and so did others. She was clearly the youngest of the women and was a school friend of the boys. Everyone was really friendly and super happy that we arrived but something felt odd about the welcome. Gabe greeted my wife enthusiastically, but barely acknowledged me, and his friend Paula looked at me like I was some kind of science experiment. They set up dinner for us, so we quickly put our bags in our room on the second floor. Our room was small and next to Gabe's master bedroom. 
We all gathered in the big hall, which was a huge room about 40 feet by 40 feet. It was a living room, dining room, and game room all in one. We sat around a big oak table and ate fancy microwave meals. The food was tasty but seemed like it took a lot of money and not much effort to make. Wine was served in large quantities. I observe my drinking as much as you can if your host is constantly trying to refill your glass. After dinner the crowd sat around the gas fireplace on the terrace. Strong drinks and marijuana appeared there. It was clear that this would be a weekend of drinking and light drug use. I began to examine my situation through careful questioning and keen observation. On the surface, I was attending a normal holiday weekend with my boss, two of his friends and their girlfriends. However, everything looked more cunning. Just a few minutes later, it turned out that Robin had a fiancé somewhere, but not here, and Sharon was married with two children and a husband at home. Sharon and Robin worked together and allegedly enjoyed a girl's only weekend at the spa together. Treason was treated casually and with humor. Paula did not take her eyes off me and did not seem to be part of this group. You'd think she was with Gabe, but she wasn't offended by his open flirting with my wife. In fact, he spent most of the night sitting between Gloria and Paula. Gabe continued to talk mostly to Gloria. My attempts to engage Paula in conversation were met with only polite interest. She sent me signals not to do anything. Around midnight, I sensed that the pleasantly excited guests were ready to retire to their bedrooms to conclude the evening's festivities, but they were waiting for something. Suddenly, Gabe turned to me and said, Lyle, you must be tired from driving so far. Yes, honey, why don't you go to bed and I'll join you later, said Gloria. No way, not until I've had another drink, I said, grabbing the bottle. Unless you want it. Gabe. I smiled at him when I said this, but inside, I was angry at this guy who was trying to flirt with my wife. I also wondered what Gloria was up to. She spent the whole evening with him, just like at a Christmas party. Is she really falling in love? Has my young wife fallen for my boss? That night felt like a waiting game, but I ended up winning. Eventually, Gloria went into the bedroom with me. In her assigned room, Gloria slipped into the shower alone. I didn't try to join her. It didn't make any sense. She acted a little cold towards me. When she came out of the shower, I slipped past her to rinse off too. I expected to find her under the covers when I came out, but she was sitting naked on the edge of the bed. Please, she said, patting the bed next to her. As I sat down, she turned to me and said, I want to have fun this weekend. Life has been hard, but I've worked really hard and I think I deserve a break. I have no issues with you. You've been a fantastic wife and mother, especially during tough times. You supported me through law school and managed our kids on my low income while I was studying. You've worked hard to keep yourself in great shape, and you still do more than your share around the house. I'm proud to be your husband. I woke up to sunlight coming through the bedroom window. Gloria usually woke up before me, but last night's drinking and smoking affected her. I got out of bed, closed the blinds, and went into the small bathroom with a shower. It was a small room, but it had everything we needed. I showered, shaved, and went downstairs before anyone else. I decided to look around before the others got out of bed. I moved from the great room to a patio with a fire pit and built-in outdoor BBQ. The patio opened onto a raised terrace with a small pool and sauna. Open water seemed like a risky proposition in the spring in these notoriously cold mountains. But as I climbed onto the terrace, I realized that the entire complex was heated the higher side of the mountain was covered with solar panels, so the pool was heated, and probably the house too. Walking across the terrace, I came to what appeared to be a small barn. There were no animals, but it was filled to capacity with adivies, snowmobiles, and gardening equipment, including several small tractors. Passing by this building, I heard the sound of a small stream in the distance. The stream flowed about 20 yards behind a locked barn with a small chimney in the roof. Looking through one small window, I saw a generator and fuel tanks. In this way, gasoline was stored for sports vehicles and a generator for emergencies. Someone took care of everything. This place was an isolated world. Obviously, it was ready for any eventuality. The stream was small and shallow. I thought I was too small for the fish until I saw one jump out of the small stream. Are you fishing? A voice said from behind me. I was surprised when I saw Paula standing behind me. No, not anymore. I used to when I was younger and had more free time. It's a pity, but maybe you can try it out this weekend, I replied. Do you fish? she asked. No, like you said. I don't have much time for it, I said. How about we have breakfast and then go for a walk up the mountain? It seems like a waste to come all this way and not reach the top, she suggested. 
Paula put the coffee in the stainless steel coffee maker. The kitchen had microwave-ready breakfast options. I chose instant oatmeal, and so did Paula. No one else has woken up yet. They'll probably all sleep late. How about a hike? She said, smiling. Paula obviously knew where the trail started because she led us straight to it. The summit didn't seem that far away, but an hour later it seemed just as far away as when we started. Are you sure you want to go upstairs? I asked. Why? You gave up, old man, she said. I just wonder what the others will think when they don't find us. Don't worry, I doubt your absence will bother them. And judging by the fact that the sun was almost directly overhead, it was approaching noon. The top of the mountain was a little disappointing. It was a fairly flat area with rounded edges. Two ancient wooden benches were positioned to face east towards the gatehouse and several peaks to the south and east. The fog obscured the distant view, although the air seemed fresh and clean. There was a cool breeze at midday, but nothing unpleasant. My companion sat down, clearly deciding to enjoy the view. Do you mind? She said, I would like to rest before going down. No, the old man could use a break, I said. This made me smile. So Glenn is a broker, Ken is a banker, and Gabe is a developer. But we talked all night and I never heard what you do. She looked at me appraisingly. Apparently, she was deciding what the harm was. I'm an inspector. I work for the government. The job is low paid and very boring, she said. Have you ever inspected anyone we know? Oh, not recently. When we were in college, it felt like I was always needed to help the kids. You know, protecting them from upset girlfriends or giving them notes for exams. They were always on the edge. But that's what makes them special, you know, extraordinary young people. So, is this your job? Are you helping them out? What's the point of locking the barn door after the horse has already run away? It won't help you get your horse back. Rules only hold things back. It's better if smart people raise their hands and the rest are pushed aside to make way. The best thing is that in the end, everyone benefits according to their own merits. So what is your task for this weekend? It seems like you didn't attend the party last night, I said. She fell silent as if the question had taken her by surprise. I stood up and walked to the side where I could see the road leading down the mountain. There was no other way, only one way out, the only way out. I turned and glared at Paula. Has she thought about this? The rest were, as I realized in a moment of gestalt, completely blind to everything except their own physical appetites. But is it? Obviously, she was looking. She must see the problem the same way I do. I'm just here as a designated Tito Taylor. I make sure everything is going well, that nothing untoward is happening. Any problems are rejected. I don't want to interfere unless absolutely necessary. You mean unless the Golden Boys need you? I don't think I would put it that way but I can certainly see what's best for them, for everyone, in the long run. Should we go downstairs? I asked. What a rush. The way back will be faster? Yes, faster, but the slope is steep and may be more dangerous. You can fall hard. Why bother when you're at the top? She said, but she got up and began to descend. We got to the lodge without any problems, but I started feeling more worried. We found the others by the pool. I'd never seen my wife wearing a black bikini before. It showed a lot of her body with just a little bit of material. The other women were dressed a bit more modestly. As Paula and I got closer, I saw my wife sitting on Gabe's lap, kissing him deeply. They stopped kissing when they saw us. Gabe grinned like he'd been caught doing something naughty, but knew he wouldn't get in trouble. My wife's smile looked too big and fake. Hey, where have you been? She asked. She said, as if she were talking to some random friend. An awkward silence followed. I felt my fist clench. But then Paula grabbed my hand. Well, we obviously missed lunch. And since we made it to the top of the mountain, we deserve some food, Paula said, dragging me towards the cabin. As we left the pool, I heard muffled laughter. I don't know what Paula has prepared. If I ate, I don't remember. She forced a black Johnny Walker on me. It was straight and burned my throat. Think before you act, she said. It's just one weekend in a good marriage, and you need to think about your family. When we returned to the pool, the couples were already settled in the jacuzzi. The men laughed. The women giggled. My wife was still sitting on Gabe's lap. I didn't see his or her hands underwater, but I assumed they were both occupied. They were passing around a joint, and it was clear that everyone was high. Paula took a position where she could watch and where she was positioned between the jacuzzi and me. I pretended to drink more and then definitely walked away. I poured the glass when I was out of sight. It's a strange feeling of jealousy mixed with excitement. On the one hand, I was proud of my wife, but on the other, I was very disappointed. 
She worked long and hard to transform herself from the chubby girl I married. She was now a beautiful, athletic woman and rightfully desirable, was proud that men wanted nothing more than to slip into the arms of her strong and loving arms. But what happened to her soul while she was building this fabulous body? Seeing her with Gabe was oddly sexy. I could imagine these perfect bodies united in intercourse. A nightmarish vision, both terrifying and exciting. I wandered around the grounds of the lodge, observing how everything worked. I was just passing the time and feeling anxious about where things were heading, knowing that in the end, I might have to take control of my choices. I went into our bedroom and tried to force myself to sleep. As I lay there, trying to calm down, I couldn't stop thinking about why my wife was flirting and kissing another man. We've been through a lot together from being poor in the beginning, to dealing with our children's illnesses, and struggling to make ends meet on a middle-class income. We were finally starting to get to a safe and comfortable place. The kids were old enough to take care of themselves. My wife had a decent job, and after so many tough years, I was finally making good money. We had our debts under control and our future was looking bright. Why give that up for someone as empty and vain as Gabe Zillow? There was nothing hidden behind the charm and brash bravado. Take away the flashy exterior and there's nothing underneath. Gabe has never designed a site plan, built a home, or sold a home. He was the head of a business that was run by others. He was a rich man, a rich kid, a prodigy who came from nowhere, whose only asset was the image of himself. What was Gloria thinking? She said she just wanted to have fun this weekend. Was it fun and how will it end? I was really asleep and when I went down the stairs again, they had already moved into the large room. Lunch must have come and gone. The drinks were still flowing and the joints were passing by. Gloria was back in Gabe's lap. There was no pretending that they hadn't kissed. The bikini tops were removed from all the women, including Paula, who appeared to be sharing Ken with Robin. I walked straight across the room, heading towards the kitchen and food. I was heating up dinner in the microwave when Gloria walked in. How are you? She said. It could have been better, I said. She seemed to hesitate and then made up her mind. I spent the evening with Gabe, she said. I noticed, I said, when the microwave rang. She smiled strangely when I turned to the microwave. No, I mean tonight in his room. I sat very quietly. I stood with my back to her. It was important that she not see the pain she was causing me at that moment. I see, but what about our 16 years of marriage? That's why I can do this. This is just for the weekend. I'll be with you again next week, she said. Oh, and Gaby won't be upset. She hugged me from behind, resting her head on my back. Gabe likes you. He thinks you two have something going on. It's just a short fun time for the weekend. Okay, she asked, hugging me tightly as she spoke. Can I choose? I asked. Not really, it's decided. I'm just telling you so you know, she said. She let me go and I heard her leave the kitchen. I walked to where the kitchen opened into a large room. They were already at the stairs. As they climbed, Gabe looked back. He smiled at me and gave me a thumbs up as if we were together. He said something in Gloria's ear. She turned around, waved and smiled at me. I returned to the kitchen. Obviously, everything we went through together meant nothing. My wife left me and humiliated me. I threw food out of the microwave. I made coffee instead. It was going to be a long night. As the water began to boil, I heard someone enter the kitchen. I turned around and saw Paula watching me. I didn't expect there to be caffeine. Wouldn't it be better to drink? She asked. To each his own, I said. But tell me, what is your function here? In response, she shrugged. I'm trying to help. Make sure everything stays calm. How are you going to do this? Sleep with me. She laughed. No, I won't go that far, but don't be discouraged. You'll get your wife back and maybe get a bonus. So, I said, there is money involved. Isn't it always like this? You can't make a fuss because you work for this man. You need to think about your family. What can you do but take what you're given? This is their world, not yours. It's just the way it is. A sharp cry of pleasure was heard from above. Looks like she's having fun, Paula smiled. That's good. Everyone's enjoying their time in the mountains this weekend. You know, these rocks have been here for a really long time. Our lives are just short moments compared to theirs. Thousands of years ago, they were covered in thick layers of ice, which carved through them and formed the rivers and gorges that we now have to navigate to live in our world. Sometimes we forget how fragile our existence is, Take away just one small piece, and our world could fall apart. That's when we'll realize it's all just an illusion. Paula laughed. Oh my god, you're a philosopher. No, I'm just someone who knows what's important, trying to tell what's real and what's not. 
She probably thought I wouldn't bother her, so she left me alone with the coffee and my thoughts. Around one in the morning, I went upstairs. As I walked past the master bedroom door, I heard loud screams and moans of pleasure from my wife. She was always quiet when we made love, but it seemed like he was better. He was younger and stronger, the best in everything. I assumed that my wife had found the pleasure she was looking for in his bed. I took a shower and changed into my warmest clothes. It will be cold outside. I tried to ignore the noise coming through the walls as I waited. It was already past three o'clock in the morning when silence finally reigned in the house. I waited another 30 minutes and went downstairs. In one of the kitchen cabinets I found a flashlight and candles with matches. A necessary precaution, I suggested, in case harsh reality cut off the electricity. The night was truly dark. The moon had already set. You could hear the sounds of the night in the mountains, but to someone who lives in a city, it seemed really quiet. It wasn't hard for me to find a barn and a big can of gas for motorsports. I also found a tool. There was a lock on the door of the shed where the generator was kept, but the hinge was rusty. I used the tool to open it quickly. The owners of the house had a good pump for getting gas out manually. It took less than 10 minutes to fill the can with gas. Then, I walked around the lodge for a bit and went back to where my rental SUV was parked. I put the gas can in the back, released the handbrake, and put the car in gear. I let the car roll as far down the road as possible before I started it and drove off. As I approached the bridge, I slowed down. I drove along it carefully. When I reached the gravel road, I stopped. I took my time and made sure the gasoline was absorbed into the wood of the bridge. It was a well-made and durable design. It was something carefully made. The work of experienced builders, craftsmen who made good things, Real people built a bridge so that those who live off the sweat of others could have a fun weekend. The fun was coming to an end. I dropped the match. It hissed, then caught fire. The flames rose, then I retreated. A roaring explosion of heat and fire soon followed. I heard a crash as the wood of the bridge caught fire. The flames must have been visible for miles. I turned to my car and drove slowly. There's no need to rush. Everyone who could see was now trapped on the other side. I was sure that I would be long gone before they figured out where I was. By the time morning came, I was already stopping at a gas station off the highway. I filled up the SUV and left the empty can by the pumps. Someone would surely pick it up. With that, the only link between the fire and me would vanish. I returned the SUV around 9 a.m. and got my own car. I showered again and dressed casually for work. I had two more little things to do to finish my ties with Countryman Real Estate. Bernie was a good boss, but forgetful. He often called me to pick up something he forgot in his office. I had keys to every door and every filing cabinet. When it came to his office and personal belongings, he had a large new Mahoney desk with a built-in safe. Unfortunately for him, he kept the combination in a folder marked security. It was in a locked closet, but I had the key thanks to Bernie. Twenty minutes after entering the countryman office, I took the password diary from Gabe's safe and entered the company's personal account. It would have been easy to walk away and take everything, but that was not my plan. Stealing will bring me nothing but jail time. I simply transferred the operating account to another one. When I first started working for Countryman, we set up a trust account for deposits. With each new project, a new trust account was created, a state requirement. The original trust account was long forgotten. The previous account was recorded in the archives, but not in the ledgers. It was an empty account until I put almost 20 million into it. I transferred all our cash and increased our line of credit just in case. My actions may seem like an empty gesture. Nothing was stolen. Everything was in place. But it will take several days to find and return this money. On early Tuesday morning, money transfers will go into an account that has no money in it. Many payments will be stopped. I wasn't sure how bad the situation would be, but we always owed more money to the banks than we had. We relied on borrowing money. If we lose that ability to borrow, things will be difficult, at least for a while. Countrymen will have to work hard to get a good credit score again. The longer this problem lasts, the worse it will get. Hopefully, Gabe will still be in the mountains on Tuesday. I'll leave because my next step, after I've prepared everything, will be to print my resignation letter. I was just about to leave the office and put my resignation letter on Gabe's secretary's desk when my cell phone rang. I looked at my phone and a photo of Gloria appeared on the screen. I ignored the call. A moment later, the voicemail rang. I shouldn't have listened, but I did. Baby, where are you? They say the car is missing. I'm very worried. Call me, said the wife. In about half an hour, the phone rang again. It was Gabe. 
Hey, Lyle, are you okay, buddy? Gloria is very worried. Right now, at the end, I sensed a slight threat. This brought a smile to my face. On Sunday, there were three more calls from Gloria and two from Gabe. He was more threatening on the second call, demanding that I call him back. On Monday morning, I went to pick up the children from Gloria's parents. As I was leaving, Gloria called me again. Lily, I'll be back tonight. We need to talk. If you receive this message, please call. I'm very worried. This is childish, she said. I was sure she wouldn't come back. When I arrived at her parents, they were already waiting for me. Gloria called and said you might be alone to pick up the kids. Her mother said, you need to call her son, the father said. She says she'll be back this evening. I think it's best if I wait until then. There are some things we need to work out personally. I wasn't going to get into a discussion with my relatives if I could avoid it. My relatives were not happy, but there was little they could do. My daughter realized something was wrong, but I told her, this is an adult issue between your mother and I, and to be fair to her, we should wait until she comes back to discuss it. After getting the kids home and getting comfortable, I went to our former bedroom and called Felix Rodriguez. Hey, Lyle, how are you? He asked, answering not so good Felix. I need your services. I told Felix that he's the best family lawyer I've ever known. He's good at his job and he's a good person too. What's wrong? He asked. I need to file for divorce, I said. You shouldn't joke about something like that, he replied. It's true. Gloria's having an affair with Gabriel Zillow, my boss. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. What do you want to do? Felix and I talked about it for about an hour on the phone. I made an appointment for late Tuesday afternoon to start the process. I kept getting calls from the mountain. It turns out her parents called her. Their messages were trying to make peace. Gloria alternated with Gabe. Now, there are no threats. Hey, guy, if I made a mistake, I apologize. I don't want what happened this weekend to affect our working relationship. It would be bad for everyone if you know what I'm getting at, he said. Then around five in the afternoon, Lyle, please call. Something happened here. There is no bridge. We're all trapped. Call. I need to talk to you, the wife said. First thing Tuesday morning, I called Stephen Pender, my old companion. We agreed to meet for lunch at a modest diner in one of the shopping centers. Are you sure about this? Stephen asked between bites of his pepper jack tuna sandwich. Already done. I have officially resigned, I said, as if to underline this fact. I received a call from Donna, my secretary at Countryman Lyle. They say you resigned, but you have to come. Everything here is going to hell. Something is very wrong, Donna said. Sorry, I cannot. I don't work there anymore. I suggest you call Gabe. They say he's stuck in the mountains. Something about a bridge. Hey, sorry to hear that. Well, don't worry. I'm sure everything will work out in the end. Something I should know about, Steve asked. No, I'm not interested anymore, I said. Well, if you're sure, I think I can increase my last offer by Tyler Tandals a year. If you can start right away, Steve said. Is tomorrow too soon? No, that would be perfect, I replied. On Wednesday morning, I started working at Pandaren and Partners. I had barely settled in by Wednesday afternoon when I had a visitor. Where's my money? You're a jerk, Gabe Zillow said. What money are you talking about? I asked. Well, you know, the funds for running things, he replied. Sorry, but maybe you should speak to the company accountant. If I do what you're asking, I'll sue you for stealing money, he said. I just smiled at him. He found a way to get off this mountain. But where are the means to run things? You think you're some smart lawyer, but you're just a jerk who can't make his wife happy. She had a great time with me and I'll keep seeing her whenever I want, he said, and then ran off. The next day, I got a call from the police. They asked me to come to the station to answer some questions. Sorry, I just started a new job, so I have very limited time. But I can answer your questions in writing and call you back, I said. The officer tried to explain that they don't usually do that, but I quickly explained that I'm a lawyer and I prefer to do everything in writing or not at all. We walked in circles for a few minutes and then he hung up. I knew the police would have to verify the embezzlement charge before they could act. This would mean tracing the money. I expected them to find the money in the company account where I deposited it a few days ago. This should all end there. After that, it will simply be a civil matter, and an unsuccessful one at best. I was wrong. It took them two weeks to find the missing funds. By then, the countryman was in very serious trouble. Its credit has been completely closed by the banks and will require an injection of new capital to reopen it. Gloria showed up late Friday evening with both of our suitcases from the trip. 
Her key didn't work because I changed the locks. I met her at the door. She didn't look very good. Please, Lyle, let me in. If not for me, then think about the children, she said. No, I won't let you in because you don't live here anymore. I parked your car on the street. I assume you still have the car keys, I said. Do you hate me that much? Yes, I said and closed the door. I decided she would go to her parents. I asked Felix to give her a restraining order and file for divorce. The few days of peace that the break gave me were worth it. Felix made sure she couldn't come near me, and I got temporary custody of the kids. It took her two months and probably all the money she could find to get things going. By then, the divorce was already happening, and we just had to figure out the details. Countryman Real Estate had to shut down. They stopped working right after Labor Day. The following week, I had a visit tour. He was sitting in the visitor's chair when I returned from closing the third deal. He was deeply tanned and looked quite healthy. He was lightly dressed for the early northern autumn. Bernie, how are you? I asked. I'm fine, he said, craning his neck to look around my meager office. What brought you to the cold north? I asked, feeling that this was not a random visit. Well, here's the thing. Uh, okay. Florida is infested with sharks, and very few of them are in the water. I thought it best to go back to what I know, he said. Oh, I think it's good that you're back, I said, not knowing what else to say to his confession or what he wanted from me. Bernie, read the question in my eyes. I dropped a good chunk of cash there. I'll have to start over and start small, but it looks like I'm lucky. This company I own seems to be affordable, he said, a smile touching his face. I looked at him and smiled back. We both stopped laughing. So what do you want from me, old pirate? Well, here's the thing. I need a partner. At my age, the bankers believe that any business I start will have no continuity. And well, you and I would make a good team. So what do you say? I have very little money. You may have heard that I'm going to get a divorce, I said. Yes, I heard, he said. I wonder how much he heard. The story spread fast. Hey, how about I give you 10%, he suggested. 50, I replied. Come on, be reasonable. You just said you don't have any money. Maybe I do. But I'll agree to 45%, I said. Listen, 25% is fair, but it's not enough, he argued. How about 40% and an option to buy another 10% in 10 years? All right, I just hope I live long enough to see it, said the man who I knew would be at my funeral. Bernie and I are back in business. We bought every lot countryman owned at a discount from the banks, who were now holding them using the same bank's money. I thought it would be difficult for us, but we soon had a very strong business building and selling houses. Life moved on as usual and so did my divorce. It was mostly a custody and visitation battle. We ended up developing a complex joint custody and visitation system. That's why I came home to a dark and empty house on Christmas Eve. Gloria took the children for Christmas. I was supposed to get them for Christmas. Since Christmas was on a Sunday, they had to return to her place on Monday, which was her day off. The kids couldn't stand this kind of routine. As I approached the house, I saw a figure sitting on the steps. She was sheltered from the cold and light falling snow. I was next to her before I recognized my ex-wife. Gloria, what are you doing here? I asked. She didn't look very good. She was even thinner than the last time I saw her, and her eyes seemed empty and indifferent. She had clearly cried at some point in the recent past. I want to go home, she moaned. Where are the children? I asked not listening to her plea. My parents want to come back too. We all want to be a family again in our little house. What you did to us isn't fair. I didn't do anything like that? Well, yeah, that's true. I made a mistake. Okay, it was a really bad and hurtful mistake, but it was just one mistake. You're the one who broke up our family, she accused. An anger could be heard in her voice. She made a conscious effort to calm down. I told myself I wouldn't lose my temper, but please understand I have anger issues over this, she said. You have anger problems. I was amazed. Don't pretend to be innocent. You're not like that at all. Did you just happen to be ahead of everyone else? I'm not stupid. Lyle, you were never a saint. I know I hurt you, but I didn't mean to, I said. Do you really expect me to believe that you thought having sex with another man right in front of me wouldn't hurt me? I asked. She turned away. My words obviously hurt her deeply. I saw her wiping her eyes with her hands, even though her back was now turned to me. It was clear that she was crying. I was always the overweight one, the one nobody wanted to dance with. I had to accept whoever asked me. I tried to be a good person, so I spent a lot of time defending myself against mean comments. But when I met you, I felt like I found the right man. 
I was a virgin when we got married. I didn't make a big deal out of it, but I thought you knew. You are not a prince now, and you certainly weren't then. You were an ordinary guy, but I loved you with all my heart. Yes, you were a little smarter than the others and a little more ambitious, but we were always broke. I learned to live with lower expectations because I loved you. It hurt me to see you struggling so hard. Then Gabriel came along and everything seemed to get better. He had everything a woman needs in a man. This time the prince wanted me. It was very flattering. After the Christmas party he kept calling me. It wasn't serious, just flirting. You know, beautiful women get things like this all the time. It's not that I haven't been pestered, but not by people from the beautiful, powerful elites. He said nice things about you and how lucky I am to have such a wonderful boyfriend like you. I bet he just fucking loved me, I said. Exactly. He said how hard you work and how he wants to reward you. I knew what he was saying. If I'm nice to him, he'll take care of you. I guess I let him convince me that you would win if I gave in to him. It's true, as is the fact that I wanted him. It was as if there was some crazy sound in my head that was leading me to him. I was torn between hoping that something would happen this weekend and being afraid that it would. Once we got there, all my resistance began to fade away. I turned to you. I did it. I asked you, are you joking? You told me you would go to bed with him. Okay, okay. I didn't say it directly, but you knew what was happening and you didn't stop it, she said, facing me. Tears were flowing down her cheeks and falling from her chin. Her nose was running. I trusted you. Like I said, we were together for 16 years. How could you betray me like this, I asked. But that's the thing. We loved each other. It was just a short-term thing. Nothing compared to what we had before and what we will have after. Are you so crazy that you believe that after hearing you scream in pleasure for him, we can have anything we want? Oh damn, you can't be that stupid. It was all a sham. I wanted to be good for him. I put on quite a show. Such people need and expect it. I never act like that in bed. And you should know that after 16 years of making love to me, I only know what you did. How you humiliated me. You took the golden boy instead of me. The jerk who gives nothing and takes everything. Powerful, isn't it? So where is he now? What happened when the crisis came? I'll tell you everything. He folded his hands. We live in a society that maintains the power of the few over the many on the myth of some secret genius they possess. Tell me, how did the genius manage to go down the mountain so quickly? He called for a helicopter. By then, he already knew that you had done something with the business. It was very clear that you had ruined things. He thought you took his money. The others started to worry. Paula said this couldn't be true, that it couldn't happen like that. When the helicopter came, there was only space for Gabe. The others decided to leave. I think the National Guard eventually made a temporary bridge to rescue us. Sharon and I got back together. By then, her husband already knew the truth. She got into trouble just like me. Poor Robin's fiance broke off the engagement. Glenn and Ken both got into trouble, but I think they got out of it with Paula's help. I think it was only Gabe and us regular people who really bore the brunt. But wasn't the pain enough? She asked, looking at me hopefully. There was a lot of truth in Gloria's words. I wasn't entirely innocent. I worked for Gabe. But unlike the rest of the world, I never put myself with him. I knew the truth, but I refused to admit it to myself. I can't get past how it happened. They contain nothing but false promises. If you look closely, you can see a trap, but no one looked. Illusion is much better than reality. We fought through difficult times and they passed with time. What you and Gabe took from me was the safety of my home. I will never be able to recover this because those bastards proved that what I believed in was an illusion. You and I were just a dream, I said. Saying this, I stood up and walked towards the door of the dark and empty house. She didn't want to give up. Answer me this, she said. Would you rather be alone without me? Or would you rather be with me and our children by the Christmas tree tonight? I looked at her. It would have been easy to hug her, love her, take the kids home to sleep in their own beds on Christmas Eve, and pretend that nothing had happened. But all I could say was, that's a good question, but I don't have an answer. With those words, we turned away from each other. What happened in the past can't be changed. We have to focus on our future. Second story, husband cheated while out of town searching for a trans woman to have sex with. I'm eight months pregnant and my baby could come any time now. My husband went out of town for a week, and while he was gone, he was messaging a trans woman on a texting app, trying to meet up for sex. His messages seemed desperate, like he really wanted her to come over and have sex with him. 
I found out about all of this, but still decided to stay with him. Then, I saw him chatting happily with a girl at the dog park. It turns out it was the same girl who never talks to me when I'm there, except to ask if I'm someone's wife. She gives me strange looks and never says hello or talks to me. I didn't know that my husband goes to the dog park to play with her dog, and he told me he likes her dog. After all this cheating and suspicious behavior, I downloaded a dating app and have been swiping through profiles. I haven't messaged any men, but I feel a deep need for love and physical affection from my husband, who I'm currently pregnant by, but it seems like he's more focused on other things than his wife and our son. So here I am now on dating apps looking at guys' profiles. Doesn't even feel right or good. I don't even care if he finds it on my phone either. His behavior is slowly making me less interested. I still love him, but after everything he keeps putting me through, I can't help but just want to end it. Fuck some other man and get the fuck over him and this terrible never-ending nightmare I managed to get involved in. Like I've stayed and stayed and hoped for him to change after catching him back to back in repeated lies. But I've been pushed so far to a point where I'm now shifting focus and even entertaining a flirt here and there from a man. Like shit, yeah, I'm pregnant, but I ain't dead. And I sure as hell am not gonna live a sorry ass lonely life married to someone who's got community dick ready to disrespect his wife every chance he gets. It is what it is. His actions are just making it easier for me to walk away. But when will I is the question. After I figure out how to be a single mom, fucking great. Men that do this to their pregnant wives deserve a special seat in hell. Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional roller coaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.